Mr. Zelensky comes to Washington. The January 6th committee recommends changes and charges, and border policy remains in limbo as communities deal with rising migration and plummeting temperatures. And to the analysis of Brooks and Capehart. That's New York Times columnist David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for the Washington Post, and what a full week it has been. It's so <laughs> good to see like both of you on this Friday night before <laughs> Christmas. So, David, let's start by talking about uh, Volodymyr Zelensky with a surprise visit. We only learned about it right before it happened. What did you make of his coming and what did you make of, of the remarks to Congress and to the American people? Well, you know, the cameras lingered on Zelensky, obviously, but I was focused on the audience. I wanted to see how members of Congress would react. And I have to say, in a country that's bitterly divided, I thought time and again the room rose almost as one. Of course, there were dissenters in the room. But by and large, there was whooping, there was cheering, there were women in blue dresses, guys in yellow ties. It really struck me this is something that's touched deeply a lot of Americans of all different stripes. And I think Zelensky used his remarks to show that his cause is very much akin to the ancient American cause of defending freedom, defending human dignity, opposing authoritarianism. And so I thought he reminded us of what we would like to be. And I think in that way, um, it was a, a triumph. What did you see in here? Um, I have to agree with, with David um, that I thought President Zelensky's speech was a reminder of, of who we want to be, who we are, who we are to the world. That we've grown up watching those grainy black and white videos of Churchill speaking before Congress. Everyone talks about Churchill. Now we have our generation's Churchill, President Zelensky. And I don't think it was lost on a lot of people just how dangerous the trip was for him to leave his country, to get to the Polish border, to get on that plane, have those meetings, give that speech, and then get back in place uh, to help to help run run the war, push back against Russia. It was historic, it was inspiring, and those and it was nice in a town where there's so much division to see a, a majority of the Congress stand up, but those few dissenters are also people who are going to have positions of leadership and authority in the next Congress, in the next Republican majority. And that is just the one thing that I found concerning. And so given that, David, um, does, his, does that visit and what he had to say, his very presence, make a difference in terms of being able to count on aid continuing to come from the United States? I think if you had asked us if support would be this high back in February, I think we would have thought, oh, it'll, some of it will drain away. Will Europe be strong as they are? We would have thought some of it was drain away, but that really hasn't happened. Vladimir Putin has done an excellent job organizing and uniting opposition to him. Uh, I think it's also significant first that of, of the trips he made and this dangerous one, he came to Washington. Uh, people think we're a nation in decline, but it's still a reminder that U.S. leadership is still needed around the world. And I think the conversations with Biden, not giving him everything he wants, but giving him something, shows that you can act with moral clarity without losing your head. <laughs> American policy has had a tendency to oscillate between extreme interventionism to oppose authoritarianism, Vietnam, Bay of Pigs, Iraq, or extreme, no, let's stay behind our, our oceans and we'll allow genocide to happen. We won't act to shore up Ukraine when Putin was testing the waters. I think the Biden administration has done an excellent job of finding that balance. They did not find it as we were true from Afghanistan. That was not idealistic enough. But the balance between ideals and practicality, saying to Zelensky, we're going to give you a lot of weapons, but not long range missiles that could destabilize them. You can dream of total victory and we support that, but you've really got to think about uh, making some agreement with Putin someday. And so I think the Biden administration has done a good job of finding that balance between the ideals we believe in and something that's actually practical and useful. What about that and, and whether Zelensky helped his case? Uh... Well, I think he helped his case certainly with the American people. It's rare the American people get to see a, a war hero standing there, addressing them, reminding them, again, to what we were talking about before, about who we are and how their story, how the Ukrainian story fit, fits into the larger global story of democratic ideals, small d democratic ideals uh, in the world. I also think to the point about um, the unity 
that's been that's held here in the states but also in Europe I, I, I it may, when you said that I thought about the midterm elections that was an existential moment for the country are we going are we going to allow MAGA Republicans mm -hmm. to take over or are we going to push back and I think that support for the war for Ukraine's effort to push back against Russia it's an it's an existential an ex existential war and I think the president has framed it well this is not just pushing back against Russia's invasion. It is about democracy versus autocracy, and democracy must win. And I think as long as people understand that fundamentally that's what Ukraine's um, mission is, I think the support will be there. And speaking of democracy, uh, the January 6th committee did, it's very near the end of the year, they did come out with their final report this week. Uh, they laid hundreds and hundreds of pages out there, recommendations. We talked to Zoe Lofgren about it tonight. David, what what statement do you think is most stays with you about what they've done? And I mean, what is their what is the legacy of this? Well, case? I think in the eight chapters they had there, they laid out the broad scope of the conspiracy. It was not only starting the lie. It was not only sending people to Capitol Hill. It was it was trying to influence the states. It was a whole it was a whole broad thing. And so I think they they really established that. And even if people weren't always paying attention, they clearly had an effect on the political culture of the country. Second thing, um, before this committee, we would have um, a, a witness, a few bloviating members of Congress, <laughs> and it, it was good, some of them were good, <laughs> but that's not how committees are gonna be held anymore. They clearly took the reins, they said we're gonna have an audio-visual lesson every time for the American people, and my newspaper has a story on, the, the Congress had no facilities no control room, no audiovisual. It was just like a guy on a laptop. And so this committee hired a former ABC News executive, a whole team. They built a mock, a, a control room. They did what you would do if you want to lay a case out in an audiovisual way to the American people. I imagine that every committee from now on is going to do that. And so it will change the nature of committees. In some ways, good. In some ways, not so good. But they were a pioneer in how Congress does investigations. What do you take away from their final report, the end of all of this? Um, I am happy, you know, we went through, what, 10 hearings, televised hearings, not all bunched together. Um, the beauty of this report is that it puts it all in one place. It, yeah, it's 845 pages. Most people won't go through it, but that's not the point. Now we have a record for history that we can go back to, turn back to, to not only learn about what happened and just how coordinated this was. For a while, we all talked about the January 6th as this organic uprising that just happened because the president gave a speech and no. What we see is it was a multifaceted, coordinated effort to overturn a free and fair election. And to have all of that, not just the story, but the evidence, the testimony, the transcripts, everything in one place, I think, is something that, um, you know, to David's point, will change the way Congress does investigations from here on out. Any way, in any way, David, is it diminished, though, by the fact that on January the 3rd, this new Congress comes in, Republican majority in the House, and they're going to, not, not only will the committee be disbanded, but they're going to turn the tables and start investigating Democrats. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, we'll see. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's diminished. They laid out a strong case. They persuaded skeptics like me. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they, as I say, they had an effect on the country. So now we move to a different arena, uh, whether the Justice Department will do anything, whether somebody else. So that, that, it's not like this suddenly ends because the Republicans took over the House. The one thing I didn't like about the committee um, is the suggestion that we use the disqualification act of the piece of the 14th mm -hmm. amendment I, I just think i understand why you would want to disqualify donald trump from ever being president again i just think in a society so r full of distrust where people think the washington game is rigged the people who need to disqualify donald trump are the voters and if we try to do it anyway it will have a negative consequence of a severe form in my view so. You're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> when you have a, when you have an example of Donald Tr as as extreme as Donald Trump, absolutely that should be in there. We've never seen anything like him, anyone like him before, and so 
it applies to if it applies to him if he's the only one who is gutsy enough to try to overthrow a free and fair election and it only applies to him great i don't know if anyone would have the guts to do that again so it is just a matter of hours before christmas and whether you observe <laughs> christmas or not i have to ask a question about okay yeah there's a stocking hanging by the chimney uh who are some people who's somebody david who you think should uh, get something nice from Santa uh, on Christmas, and and who's somebody who you think maybe needs some coal? <laughs> yeah. Well, for the nice, I'll stick with the nice. Uh, maybe I'll leave off the coal. But uh, you know, the White House Chief of Staff, President Chief of Staff Ron Klain, everyone dumps on the White House Chief of Staff. Uh, they blame him for everything. They can't blame the president, so they blame the Chief of Staff. They've had a good year. The White House has had a good year. I assume Ron Klain has had something to do with that. <laughs> and so I, the long-suffering, neglected non Klain, I hope Santa, not even a stuffing stock or a, a whole model train set. <laughs> he can do this Thomas the Tank Engine, whatever he wants to do. And I think he deserves a train set. Do we think he likes trains? I, mean, I have no don't. idea. <laughs> and what about the coal? Well, uh, this will be a little more serious. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just look at the schools and the effect that the long and overly, overly, overly long school closures during COVID had on school student attainment and the lifelong prospects of a generation of young people. And I do blame a lot of different people for that, but I think the teacher unions blame, uh, bear a share of the blame for really widening inequality, hurting social mobility, and hurting a lot of students. So they get my call. They get your call. All right, only a little over than a minute. And it's okay, so my I, fault, but uh. I'm going to start with coal and groups. <laughs> groups of people first, okay. the IRS, for not auditing President oh. Trump's taxes as they're supposed to do under law when he was uh, president of the United States. That was one of the many breaking news stories that hit last week, uh, this past week, and also the members of Congress who did not. Um, comply with the subpoenas from the January 6th committee to do what I think is, is their patriotic duty to talk about what they knew uh, and what happened during during January 6th. As for NICE, another, uh, another group of people, the Democrats, the Independents, and the Republicans who came out in record numbers in the midterm elections to push back against MAGA Republicans who were seeking office, people who believed in the big lie, people who were supported by um, former President Trump. And the, I mean, it worked. Th those groups of people getting, the nice, getting on the nice list, they made sure that Democrats held on to the Senate and the Republican red wave turned out to be less than a trickle in the House. So they get Thomas the tank engine. Yes, they get the train set. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Well, it's so great to see you both on this Friday before Christmas. Jonathan Capehart, David Brooks, thank you both. Thanks, thank you, Judy. Judy.